Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the National Aquariums and Miss a Last Movie collaboration. This is our first time working and talking with the group, um, Miss, and we are going to give you a little bit of background into what Elasma Week is and why we um, actually started to collaborate with the group. And so my name is Simone Barkley, the Manager of Education Programs here at National Aquarium. And um, Elasma Week is something that was created recently uh, in response to uh, the lack of diversity in uh, sharks and rays and skates and things of the sort that are shared in Shark Week on Discovery Channel, but also um, in response to the lack of diversity in researchers and scientists that are featured during Shark Week. And so uh, we wanted to, uh, oh, not, it, this wasn't even my idea. Um, someone that was actually on the internet, on Twitter, in the community, um, they created this and reached out to myself and the, the ladies that are on this um, on the Zoom call and asked if we wanted to collaborate and wanted to put out some information about our work with sharks and um, to shine a new light kind of on the different species that there are in the um, in this research community and on the types of people who actually do this research because um, minorities are in this work and we want to make sure that we also get um, some shine and get to share our work. And so here we are with um, some of the folks and researchers who are featured during Elasma Week. And we are also joined by Jenny Jensen, who is one of um, the staff members here at National Aquarium. So Jenny, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Jenny Jansen. I'm one of the assistant curators here at the National Aquarium over the sharks and the jellies. Um, and to tell you a little bit about MISS, which is Minorities in Shark Science, which is the group that our four panelists who are with us today, they have co-founded this group. And I love this story. Um, as the story, as I've heard it, is that this past June, June 2020, um, these four beautiful women got together and found each other as a result of the Black in Nature hashtag that was created as part of the Black Birders Week on Twitter. And in finding each other, there was that immediate sense of community and they were like, hey, let's start a club. And this, this group, Minorities in Chart Science, has really taken off and it's been amazing and I've joined it myself. Um, and the aims are really to support each other amplify each, each other's work in this field and provide opportunities for other women of color or that are, those that are looking to get into this uh, field of shark science, including creating uh, workshops in conjunction with the field school for women of color to get hands-on shark research experience with the aim to remove the financial barrier for all participants. With the bigger idea being that diversity in scientists leads to diversity in thought, which in turn leads to innovation. Um, so again, it's a very new group, but in this short period of time, there are over 100 members from 10 plus countries. I mean, my first question is, did you guys even think that the community was this large when you just found each other at the very beginning, you know? And beyond that, they've created a group um, within MISS that is friends of MISS for those who are not minorities in shark science, but for those who would like to support the mission and the efforts. So with that, I would love to introduce to you Jasmine Graham, Jada Elcock, Amani Weber-Schultz, and Carly Jackson. And the way that the today's live stream is gonna go is that we'll have this panel discussion between the four ladies here and how to get involved in Elasma Brank research. And then afterwards, we will have a little Q&A of some questions that have been um, submitted on social media. So, Simone? All right, thank you, Jenny, for that marvelous introdu introduction. And um, I must say that, again, I, and I shared this with the, with the members of MISS um, a little while ago, but when I saw this group um, being formed and when I uh, reached out, to, when they, we also connected during that hashtag Black in Nature. Um, that's how I even found a lot of them. Um, and so I'm very, very excited that they formed this group and 
love everything that they're doing. And just like I told them, if this group was around when I was doing research on sharks, I might still be doing research on sharks because it's really nice to have a community. Um, and so I'm very, very proud, honestly, to, to see them here um, and love the work that they're doing and in full support of everything. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, it makes me very happy to see y'all here. Um, okay, now let's get ready for our panel. So we're just gonna have each person introduce themselves and then we'll go into some questions. So Jasmine, you're up first. Hello, I'm Jasmine Graham, and um, I'm currently serving as the project coordinator for the Marine Science Laboratory Alliance Center of Excellence, or MARSI LACE for short, uh, which is a program that's geared towards recruiting, supporting, and retaining minority students in marine science. I also am a shark biologist, uh, so I specifically study the evolution and ecology of sharks and rays. Uh, my current research focuses on understanding the movement ecology of the small tooth sawfish, which is a critically endangered ray species that we have here in Florida. Thank you, Jasmine. All right, next we have Jada. Hi, my name is Jada Elcock. Um, I am a first year graduate student at the University of Washington uh, studying uh, elasmobranch ecology most likely will be focusing on elasmobranch movement ecology like Jasmine. Um, I got my bachelor's degree from Northern Arizona University, so living in a landlocked state was a little bit different, but uh, I guess, yeah, you can, you can still be a shark scientist even if you grew up in a landlocked area. So yeah, that's me. Thank you, Jada. Next we have Amani. Hello, my name is Amani Weber-Schultz. I recently graduated from Rutgers University with a Bachelor's of Science in Marine Science uh, in May of 2020 during the pandemic, so that was fun. Uh, I'm not currently doing any of my own research, but in my undergrad, I worked in multiple labs. Uh, labs. One of them was a paleoceanography lab, uh, and the other one was a fluid dynamics, biomechanics, functional morphology lab. Um, I am mostly interested in functional morphology of sharks. I'm also really interested in their physiology and conservation, um, and I can't wait to eventually be doing my own research. Um, thank you so much, Imani. And last but not least, we have Carly. Hey guys, my name is Carly Jackson. Um, I am currently a sea turtle specialist, so I work with sea turtles uh, here in South Florida. I recently graduated with my master's in marine science from Nova Southeastern University this past summer, defended in the middle of a pandemic. Yay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I focused my research on the effects of provisioning tourism, so feeding tourism on nurse sharks in Belize. Um, and I got my bachelor's degree from Florida Atlantic University, also down here in South Florida. Great. Thank you so much, everybody, for um, those introductions. And now we're going to get ready to ask some of the questions that we have prepared. So first question is, when did you first become interested in science and how did you start working with elasmo breaks? So I first got interested in science when I was little, I guess. Um, I don't know exact age, but I don't know. We'll say around late elementary school. Um, I was in a magnet program that was for science and math in middle school. And um, I really just was very interested in, had a natural curiosity uh, for having questions and wanting to figure them out. Uh, so I just was naturally drawn to the sciences. I started working with elasma ranks specifically in college. Um, so in high school, I learned that you could actually do marine science as a career, because I didn't know that before. Um, and then I kind of said, oh, well, I can go hang out on boats for a job, sign me up. Uh, so I went to College of Charleston uh, to get my bachelor's degree in marine biology. And while I was at College of Charleston, I ran into a professor that was a shark scientist, Gavin Naylor, at College of Charleston during a research matchmaking day. And um, I didn't go into the research matchmaking looking for someone researching sharks, but 
he was really excited and engaging and and I just kind of fell in love with sharks through osmosis from our conversation um, and he followed up with me via email and I was actually able to work in his lab through a research experience for undergraduates uh, doing a hammerhead shark evolution uh, study and I loved it so much that I just stuck around for the rest of college and the rest is history. I just never left sharks. <laughs> yeah, that's how it kind of happens sometimes, right? Like you kind of fall into it and then you're like, oh, well, I'm here. This is what I like and I'm staying. No reason for me to leave it now. So I love that. Appreciate it. Okay, um, next Jada. Yeah, so I have always been interested in science. Like I don't ever remember having a different favorite subject other than science. Um, and like Jasmine said, I've, I've had a natural curiosity and I loved, you know, just kind of spending time outside and finding all the different animals in the area, whether it be snakes or toads or frogs or whatever else. Um, and then when I got to high school, I watched, I started watching a lot about, you know, the ocean because like I said, I grew up in landlocked state. So I was like, this is an area that I don't have access to and I wanna learn more about it. So I watched a lot of documentaries and shows and I started to learn that like sharks are very misunderstood and not like, we don't, we don't talk about how important they are. Um, and so I realized that sharks kind of need help at the moment. A lot of them are endangered um, and I figured if there was a group that I wanted to study that needed some help, why not let it be sharks? Uh, because I'm, I'm drawn to the ocean. It's beautiful and sharks are just so amazing. So in high school, I was like, all right, yeah, this is my path. I'm doing shark science. No one's getting in my way. I'm going to make it happen. And um, when I got to college, one of my professors, Dr. Alice Gibb, was like, hey, so I go to Friday Harbor Labs in Washington to do this research experience for undergrad program, you should totally apply. So I did and I got in and that's where I started studying um, skate egg cases and looking at how well they can attach to substrate uh, due to different uh, factors and variables. And through that, I met Dr. Stacy Farina at Howard University and I became her lab tech after, grad or after undergrad. Through her, I then met someone who pointed me in the direction of my current advisor. So went through a lot of different channels to meet the person I'm currently working with, but I knew that I was going to get here somehow and I did it. So yeah, just kind of, kind of making it my goal to make this happen for myself. And yeah, that's how it happens. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, sometimes it's surreal, right? Like I'm really here. That's awesome. I'm it's very nice to hear how passionate you are about it, right? Um, and your story and your past so far. And you still have so much more to go, right? You know, like you're still really early in your career and you've already done so much, Jada. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, of course. The next Amani. Yeah, so I was introduced to the ocean from a very young age. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, so going to the Monterey Bay Aquarium is something that we started doing basically when I was born. Um, one of my earliest memories is in the Galapagos Islands, sitting in a really tiny fishing boat, just looking down and seeing all these really beautifully colored fish. Um, so the ocean is something that's like been in my life consistently um, since I was young. And I didn't actually get into sharks until my junior year of college. Um, I went to Rutgers, declared as a marine science major, but I had no clue what area of science I wanted to do. Um, and I thought shark research was cool, but there was no one at Rutgers who did that. So I was kind of just like bouncing between um, projects, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and eventually I ended up going to field school uh, under a scholarship to do their one week shark um, research, like intro to shark research course. And I loved it. It was the most fun I've had ever doing a job. And it brought me so much joy. And I was like, this is, this is it. Like, I need to do this. Um, so from that, I kind of just, I went back a couple of times. Um, I got into another research lab with Dr. Brooke Flamang at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, not doing shark research, but that's how I got into biomechanics and functional morphology. Um, and then after, uh, let's see, January, in the beginning of January, Fieldschool asked me if I wanted to do a fellowship with them. 
um, during my year off before I applied to grad schools. And I was like, duh, because I love sharks and I love you guys. Um, so that's kind of how I got into shark science. Yeah, great. That's fantastic. You saw Jenny and I smiling really hard when you were like, well, this is so fun because that's uh, what we talk about all the time when we share stories of um, doing shark research and, you know, being on the boat all day and catching sharks and seeing what we, yes, amazing, the rush. And it's so exciting. And I, y'all will probably hear me uh, reminisce a lot because I really do miss it. I miss being out on the boat and, and seeing sharks all the time and, and being excited uh, when we pull up another sand tiger or sandbar. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Um, Carly, your turn. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. So very far away from the ocean. We've got the Great Lakes, but there are no sharks there, thankfully. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think I was around like six years old and I remember seeing a book on sharks, literally just seeing a book that said sharks. And I was like, I have to read this book. Um, and my mom was homeschooling me at the time. So she was like, all right, I'll get this book for you. And I read it and immediately I knew, I was like, this is what I wanna do. I wanna work with sharks. They're just so cool. Um, so since then, like I always, science was my favorite subject. I loved learning anything about nature and I loved being outside. Um, so I always knew I would be going to college, like somewhere near the ocean. So I said, goodbye, Michigan, I'm going to Florida. <laughs> um, but I didn't get my first experience really working with sharks until, um, like senior year of college. Um, I went to Dr. Marianne Porter's lab. She has a biomechanics lab at FAU and I helped one of her PhD students. They were dissecting vertebrae of different sharks. So that was kind of my first experience in the lab working with sharks. And then my first field experience with sharks started in grad school um, at Nova Southeastern University. I went on tagging trips with them and that was really my first time getting hands-on work with sharks and like really seeing sharks up close. And I just remember like crying inside being like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> and um, I knew I always would love field work. I love being on boats. Like I'll just stay on a boat for a very long time and be perfectly happy. <laughs> but yeah, so grad school is kind of the start of my um, real research experience and hands-on experience with sharks. and super it's it'll never get old it'll definitely never get old <laughs> no um thank you i don't think it'll get old either um uh, jenny <laughs> <laughs> i know your stories of being in michigan i was on the other side of michigan uh near lake lake michigan mm -hmm. and i too was like it's not the same you go to the beach and it's like there's no salt in the air no it's like it looks like it should be but there's just something missing so <laughs> Well, the next question that we have is, since you all have experience working in the labs, what, you know, you've all gotten there by slightly different ways, what is, how would each of you recommend someone who wants to get in this field join up with a lab? Jasmine, do you want to start? So I think the, the biggest thing that I would uh, recommend is that you kind of just see what's out there because you might be surprised if you go in kind of pigeonholed and saying, I only want to work with dolphins and I'm going to ignore all the other parts of marine science, you might miss out on the thing that you're really passionate about. So if you find someone and they say like, oh, I have a position in my lab, you can come work with insert random thing here, plankton, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, you should just try it. You never know. I didn't go into college thinking I'm going to do shark research. I just kind of was like, oh, they offered me a position. He sounds excited about it. I'm going to try it. Uh, so you never know what you'll find. I know people that, that study bryozoans and invertebrates, and, and they didn't know that they were going to like studying little things that live under docks, but they really get excited about it. So I think it's really important to just go for it and just try everything that you have the opportunity to try because you might find something that you really like and it might be something unexpected that you didn't know about or you didn't think you would like. 
And I also think there's value to having experiences where you find out what you don't like. So I worked in a lab doing microplastics for a semester and I discovered I really hate microscopes, hate them with a passion. <laughs> so what I learned from that is Jasmine needs to study things that you can see with the naked eye. <laughs> so it's just as valuable to have experiences where you learn what you don't like um, especially early on because you don't want to get stuck in you're doing a dissertation on plankton all of a sudden and you realize that you hate microscopes and you say well I got seven more years to go I guess I gotta suck it up so if you have the opportunity to try things go ahead and try them especially if you have a program like a research experience for undergraduates or something like that that's structured uh, where you're getting paid just give it a shot. What do you have to lose? Worst case scenario, you don't like it. And now you know to, that's not something you're interested in. So I definitely think that it's worth uh, being open-minded when you're looking at opportunities. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I definitely, I didn't go about it that way. I've just been stuck in this mindset of, I know what I'm going to do with my life because I'm I don't know, very, I'm stubborn and driven and I know what I want. So I was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. But I do think that it's a really good idea to be open-minded too, especially if you're not exactly sure what you want to do yet, or if you're not exactly sure what you like. Um, I would say, I guess my biggest advice is kind of be, become friends with like a lot of people, like a lot of, like talk to your professors, go to office hours, even if you don't need help. Um, and just kind of get people to know who you are and know what you're interested in or what you're potentially interested in, um, ask around and just kind of, I guess, push your way a little bit into a, well, I guess not aggressively push your way into a lab, but like make a name for yourself and make sure people know who you are and, and you will be more likely to get into a lab if people know who you are and know what you like and you're you're open about um your experiences and just going out and talking to people I think is a really good idea especially professors I think office hours are a fantastic resource even, again even if you don't need help you should go to office hours because your professors want to help you in any way that they can so ask them if they have a lab open ask them if they have if they know people that have labs open anything like that just Go out and talk to people. Yeah, networking is definitely key. I, I feel like that's that's the message, right? Networking is so, so important. And we heard a lot of you all talk about how, you know, you were recommended by somebody else who told you about this or that other program. And that happens all the time. And honestly, um, it's a it's a really great way for you to sometimes get opportunities that um, you might even be like the exception for like maybe you don't have to apply for this one thing because someone knows you they know your character they know you you're that you're hardworking and they're are willing to to just give it to you and that because you earned it ahead before that because they know you um, and so Jada what you're what you're saying I think um, is is a great message to give to people. I had to unmute myself. Um, my biggest advice for people who want to work in labs is really just if a lab offers you a position if you don't hate what they're doing take the position um i worked in a paleoceanography lab for all four years of my undergrad that had nothing to do with sharks i was looking under a microscope at foraminifera which are just super little tiny single-celled organisms like the size of a grain of sand um and i did that fall for all four years but if i hadn't done that i wouldn't have developed the amazing relationship that i had with my advisor for the lab um, and she's the reason I actually met Brooke at NJIT. And without her, I wouldn't have been able to meet Brooke and realize that I really like doing functional morphology and biomechanics. Um, and even in Brooke's lab, I didn't do shark research. Um, I did, uh, I made 3D models for Remora research. Um, and I still got into shark research without having to do undergrad research in a lab that had to do with sharks. Um, and I had really good connections with all of them. So now I have two people who I can reach out to when I'm looking for grad school advisors and ask them like, hey, do you like this person? Do you know good things about this person? Is this person not gonna be a good advisor? Um, and it's really helpful to have 
people like that who are in your corner who will advocate for you and also be 100% honest with you um, in any situation. Um, and so I, yeah, networking, super important. Um, and just getting experience in general because your the experiences overlap and what you learn in labs overlap, even if they're not th on the same topic. I totally identify with that. And my master's is not in anything aquatic. I'm not even gonna mention what it is here. <laughs> That's a story for another time. But again, it's that, that general learning of the skills and the things that you're doing and the writing of the papers and the doing of the research, all of that is applicable across the board. So thank you. Carly? Yeah, I guess kind of pulling from what everyone else said, um, like my biggest advice is to stay like driven. So for me personally, I didn't do any research in undergrad because I was an athlete and NCAA kind of controls your life <laughs> in undergrad. And um, I was at one point, I was like super discouraged because I was like, I'm never going to have time to do any research. But like I was driven. And even though people were like, oh, you can't really do shark research or any research in general and be an athlete, I still did it because I said, this is something I want to do. Um, and even though I don't have a ton of experience in undergrad, like I can still, I still did things in the summer after I graduated to, um, kind of get myself in the field and get like a little bit of experience under my, um, under my wing. So, um, I would definitely say trying a lot of different things like Jasmine was saying a little earlier see what you do like, see what you don't like. I remember, I think the last semester, my senior year, I did a project on like sponges for a class. And I had to like, I was up until like 2 a.m. cutting sponges. And I was like, I absolutely hate sponges and I'm never working with sponges ever again. <laughs> and they have those little spicules that get caught in your finger. Oh my gosh, I can go on and on about how much I hate sponges. But I mean, without, <laughs> without um, going through that, I wouldn't have, realize you know like I don't really enjoy sitting in a lab and working very meticulously on one thing I like being out on boats doing field work and then coming back and like working on a computer and um I think it is very beneficial to get your foot in the door and try out a bunch of different things um just to you know make sure you don't have like a hidden passion for something else too um, but also developing relationships with your professors are very, very key because networking, like everyone said, is very important in this line of work. Um, it's a small-ish community, relatively small compared to different disciplines. So most people know each other. So, um, and your professors aren't scary, like they're humans, they're normal humans who enjoy human interactions. So reaching out to them um in undergrad is definitely I remember freshman sophomore year I was like oh they're scary like professors are scary then I talked to one I think with Dr. Porter we actually were in the same master swimming um program so I was like oh hey like you swim too and we kind of just connected with that so your professors aren't scary definitely um network with them and reach out with them reach out to them so And I uh, wanted to just add a little bit on to what Amani said about uh, reaching out to professors and learning a little bit, having them give you some insight about if one lab is a good one over a, a different lab. I think that's so important to reach out to people even in a lab that you might be interested in, like reach out to the students that are in that lab already and ask them, how do they feel about being in the lab? How is it going for them? How's the relationship with the advisor? Um, you know, if you have a particular like learning style um, or a style of like being managed, because that's kind of like what it's uh, what it's like when you go to graduate school, like they're kind of like your manager, um, your supervisor. So I think it's really important to learn about the lab that you're going into and to get um, input from the people who are there or adjacent, right? People that are close to, to that lab and doing that work. Um, that's really important. I'm very happy with all of the insight y'all are giving. Uh, this is lovely. Um, okay, so next question. 
is what advice do you have for women of color who want to enter a STEM field and how can allies most effectively advocate for women of color in STEM fields? Okay, well, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, my advice to women of color is, uh, so one of our members, Triana Argena, said something really powerful in a session that we did with the GSO Ocean Classroom. She said, I'm gonna paraphrase it because I'm not gonna get it exactly. But she said, everyone deserves a seat at the table, but sometimes you have to bring your own chair. And um, I thought that was really impactful. And, and so I think it's really important for women of color to recognize that they deserve to be in spaces. And if they feel like people are trying to shut the door on them, just like wedge yourself in there. Don't let someone shut you out. Um, and sometimes that means that you have to be, you have to build this confidence in yourself to say, I'm supposed to be here. I know what I'm talking about. I have just as much right to be in STEM as anyone else. Um, and you have to kind of take up space uh, because people will try and, and push you around and overlook you and, and you just have to be loud and proud and, and take up your space and make sure that you are standing up for yourself and advocating for yourself and saying this behavior is not okay you can't say this to me you can't treat me like this um and that takes a lot of um confidence so just kind of i mean i wake up every day and i say little mat mantras to myself like you're awesome like you're killing it <laughs> um because if, if no one else will compliment me in a day, I will compliment myself. Like, you're doing great. Way to go. Um, and so you just kind of have to, to you know, build yourself up. And, and this is one of the reasons why we've created Miss, so that we can build each other up. So on the days where we don't feel like we're awesome, we have someone to tell us that we're awesome. Um, in terms of allies, uh, just kind of this along the same lines is, Sometimes it's a lot of burden, a lot of, it's very taxing on women of color to have to constantly push against things. And if you have a position of power and you're a major majority in STEM, then you can push back too. And your pushback will be often more effective uh, because people are more likely to listen to people that look like them. Uh, so if someone already is kind of looking down on a woman of color in science and someone steps up that's that they look up to that they see as a peer and says you can't treat people like that they're more likely to listen um than the person then listen to the person that doesn't have the power in that dynamic so it's really important whenever you see something uh to speak up for people uh to advocate for women of color and other other people in marginalized communities and say we as a culture are not allowing people to talk to or treat people in this way um and i think that's really important to be willing to put yourself on the line put you know take put your neck on the line and say i'm going to stand up for this person is is really powerful and that takes a lot of the burden off of us cuz man it's a struggle out here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say that unfortunately you you might most likely are going to get weird stares and rude comments from people. Um I personally have been told that I got a high or a college scholarship because of affirmative action when it was not because of affirmative action, it was a GPA based scholarship like it's unfortunate that sometimes you will be told that your hard work, all the things that you've worked for is because, not because you work hard, but because people feel bad for you or something like that. It's unfortunate and it's hurtful. But like Jasmine says, you just kind of have to lift yourself up, um, find yourself a community, which again is why we um, decided to make Miss a thing. We want to be able to give that community to people. So to find a community, and be able to lift yourself up and be like, you know what, that comment doesn't matter because I know that it's not true. I know why I'm here. I deserve to be here. I worked to get here. So 
yeah, I, I think it's really important to be able to have that confidence and it, it might take a while to get there and that's totally okay. Like it's okay to feel the struggle. It's okay to feel not okay sometimes. Um, but know that you are supposed to be here because science is and should be a space for everybody. So you deserve to be here and you should always be able to recognize that even if you're getting rude comments or weird stares. Um, and as for allies, I think that it is important for you to help be part of that community, be someone that someone can go to and they're like, hey, you know what? Um, I got this comment today and it made me feel bad. And you can just kind of be like, you know what? That doesn't matter. You deserve to be here. You're good at what you do. You know what you're talking about. Just kind of be that up uplifting voice. And uh, like Jasmine said, kind of, if you see that there's a problem, step up and say something because for us, it is so exhausting to have to be the person to educate someone every single time that there's a comment made. Um, and a lot of the times they don't listen. So like Jasmine said, again, they're more likely to listen to someone who looks like them. If they're making a comment towards you and you try to say something and they don't listen, that's, that's why we need like our friends to help us out. So being an ally and being able to be like, hey man, that's not cool. We don't say things like that. This is a good scientist who knows exactly what she's talking about. Kind of just being there for them, being that voice, being able to recognize when there's a problem and helping people out. Yeah, that's, that's what I have. That was great, Jada, thank you. Uh, I think that my advice is basically the same as what Jasmine and Jada have said. Um, I really like to emphasize finding a community for yourself. Um, and the community doesn't have to be with people of color. If you find pe people who aren't um, of color, but that are really supportive of you and are really good allies, then you have a community that's going to be supportive of you. I have a best friend who will 100% support me all the time um, and who will say something if someone says something to me and I don't feel comfortable replying and being like, hey, that was not okay that you just said that um, to me. Um, but just like having a community, no matter what that community looks like, is really important and feeling supported is really important. Um, because it is hard to be the only person of color in a field um, or in a classroom. And figuring out where you fit can be a lot harder when you don't have a community to support you while you're figuring that out. Um, and for allies, I think the thing I like to point out is I feel like a lot of people have a tendency to be a little afraid of trying to become a better ally because they're afraid they're gonna fail and people are gonna call them out for it. Um, and no one expects you to be perfect. No one expects you to just go from not knowing what you're doing to suddenly being the most amazing ally of all time. Um, but it's really important that you continuously try to be a better ally. We do that all the time in our life when we fail at a project or we fail at some random thing and then we keep trying. It's the same thing that applies to allyship. Like you try and you try and if you fail, you acknowledge it, you apologize to the person um, who you hurt or who you harmed and then you try your best to not do that again and you learn from what you made the mistake uh, from what mistake you made um, and it's really important that you continuously try because that's how you become a better ally you don't become a better ally by just not doing anything um, you cannot consider yourself an ally when you just don't try at all <laughs> yeah so basically what everyone else just said but um my biggest advice is don't let anyone tell you what you can't do because I did coming up in this field it was like uh like I said I was an athlete and they're like uh you can't really get into shark research if you don't have a lot of experience in undergrad or you know you can't be on shark week because there's no one on there that looks like you and you'll probably be you know you're probably not going to make it um it's definitely just like keep passion keep the passion because it is very easy to get discouraged if you're not um if you're not driven and if you're not if you're not keeping that passion so um keep the passion going and um for allies for sure i would say be very uh, empathetic and understanding of students that come to you because it's very easy if you're not aware of issues or um, you know what it's like to be a person of color in science in general 
a lot of things can just go over your head or you just might brush some things off like oh like that wasn't that wasn't offensive like whatever or if someone comes to you um saying that you know someone said something offensive you could just be like oh like that's not what they meant just be more empathetic with students and with just people that come to you with problems um try and understand it from their point of view and uh like i think like everyone else was saying like don't be silent because silence speaks a lot of words <laughs> even if you're not saying anything um that speaks a lot to the person of color in your lab um who is looking up to you for advice or for um advisors so um also another a thing i like to say is if you're a parent of a person of color who's in the field, definitely stay very supportive. I had a very big support group in my family. Like I don't come from any science family. My family is all like, they work at Ford or lawyers or musicians. So <laughs> it's no science background there. But when they found out that I was, you know, interested in marine science, they did everything they could to make sure that they um they could show me that they were supportive so just be supportive for whatever scientists um or whatever per whoever uh person of color that is striving to be a scientist in marine science and the shark science field just be supportive and um just very encouraging so that's my advice thanks carly can i add something okay. to the oh, chat? Uh -huh. yeah sorry um i was also gonna say uh for allies i think it's important to make it very well known that you are here to support us because there's sometimes where we go into a lab if we're the only person of color in the lab we don't know who would be supportive of us who might make comments that are unacceptable we don't it's it's hard to tell because there there's not an ally doesn't look like a specific person so it's it's important to make it known that you're there for those those people and you're like hey if you ever need anything, let me know. Um, I can be a resource for you. Like I'm here for you. I think that's really important. So yeah, that was my last additional comment. No, that's fine, Jada. Thank you for adding that. And Carly, you hit on just something that a little bit that I felt um, when I was in school. Um, and I think that it's really about like, recognizing if you're an ally or, or you know you're a, the, the lead of a lab. Um, recognizing that your student might not have had any previous experience with doing whatever your task might be. Like when we would go out on boats all the time, you know, like I never tied a knot, like for me to be, for us to go long lining or, you know, tying off on the cleat. I never done anything like that. Or I had never driven a boat and I don't know how to read a GPS. And so just like, because those are things that I didn't do until I got to graduate school. Um, so that's why it's really important why we always talk about like, you know, um, giving exposure early, right? It's really great if you do get exposure early. Um, and it's what I think Miss is trying to do through their work and partnering with, you know, different groups. And it's also, you know, what, what I do as an educator is try to make sure that I expose young people as early as I can to this kind of stuff. But if if you are like me and I didn't get to do any of that until I got to school, um, when you have an advisor that might be frustrated, like, why don't you know how to do this yet? Or why haven't you learned yet? Like that makes it harder for you then to want to continue to do the work. Like, you know, obviously you want to try, you are going to keep trying your best, but it is uh, really important. I think that uh, the folks who lead your, the lab, who lead the research, also have an understanding of your background and, and where you come from and your experiences and how those might influence you um, as you are doing your research. So great, great, um, great advice, everybody. Thank you. Jenny? Yes, it's all wonderful. I thank you for sharing all of that advice with everybody. Um, some additional questions that we have through social media is um, what do you wish you had known before you were starting out in this field? Do we want to go down the line or just want to take one at a time? I'll go. Um, so this is like, I don't know, kind of a silly one. Uh, I wish I knew that shark burn was a thing. 
before I went into this field. <laughs> it's a relatable reply. <laughs> Everybody's um, nodding their heads. <laughs> yeah, because I was not prepared. I was not at all. I was like, yeah, here I go in my short sleeves and my shorts, and I'm just going to put my full body, body weight on this shark, and everything's going to be hunky-dory, and then just like tail flip, and next thing you know, I'm like bleeding. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> What did that happen? Um, so yeah, so now I'm a lot more <laughs> mindful of that. Um, but I wish that I would have known that that was an experience my first time. Where I was like, how did this even, what, what is even happening? <laughs> That's Agreed awesome. That, for sure. <laughs> Jada? Um, I'm not, I, it's hard to think of a specific thing. Um, I, I don't know. I haven't experienced shark burn yet. So now I will make sure that I don't wear short sleeves and short <laughs> when I jump on the back of a shark. So here's a tip. They make just sleeves that go up to your up to your upper arm. So you can have those that you can just slip on when you're wearing your t-shirt. I'll have to steal some of my brother's like compression sleeves for yeah. baseball that they have. Yeah, that'll be perfect. <laughs> Amani? I'm having a really hard time coming up with something right now. Um, I mean, the shark burn, shark burn one is just incredibly relatable because it's not something you're expecting. Then all of a sudden you, you're like off the shark and you're burning in like one location on your body and you're wondering why there's suddenly blood. <laughs> um, I think I wish, I think I wish I knew that I didn't need to put so much pressure on myself in terms of my GPA to be able to succeed in this field. Um, I struggled a lot in school and I have a below, my undergrad GPA is below average. Um, and it's one of my largest insecurities and it's also something that I am really hard on myself over. Um, but like as evidenced by Miss Elasmo and other things that I've done recently, my GPA is not something that defines my entire being. Um, and I wish that I had been able to not be so hard on myself, um, especially in college with that, because I spent a lot of days like feeling very down in the dumps about my GPA in comparison to other people. I relate to that. As do I. Yeah. I mean, I just pushed really hard to get a really high GPA, but I was so incredibly stressed throughout all of undergrad because I put so much pressure on myself. My parents were like, we want you to get good grades. And I was like, I only got a 90 on this test. And my mom was like, oh my God, calm down. That's literally still an A, like you're fine. And I, I pushed myself too hard. And honestly, I just, I think that it's important to make sure that you're having a good experience, not that you're stressing yourself out to the point where you're not having fun with school anymore. Like the, you're going to college because you want to do what you're doing. And I, I made it harder than it needed to be. So yeah, GPA is not your biggest, it should not be your biggest concern. It was mine and I kind of regret that. So don't put as much pressure on yourself as I did on myself, I would say. Yeah. I think that's a great point, uh, both of you. I was recently at my alma mater and uh, I had gone out to dinner with some of the professors and they were like, and I was confessing to them. I was like, I wasn't the best student. You know, it's like I was trying hard and I was doing, you know, well, but like definitely not like in the upper echelons of the class, you know, and, and they were like, please talk about that, please. Because a lot of the people that are like acing it through, the student can't really relate to. So, and so many, um, you know, so many of us that, you know, are doing great work, regardless of where we were in the GPA spectrum of the academic world. Um, and it's really so much of what we do that has to do with that undefinable grit, you know, that tenacity and drive that we have for what we do and the passion. So I think, I think what you both of you are saying is, is incredibly important. I think um, you know, those teaching in the undergrad um, are really capturing a lot of that right now. So great advice. Your testing ability does not define you. 
<laughs> your one hour and a half calculus exam that you bombed does not mean you can't work in a science field. And I will yell that until I die. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I have something to add too that I thought of that's more of a serious thing than shark birth. But um, yeah, I think kind of going along with that, I wish that I had known that it was okay to like breathe. Uh, so I went straight from undergrad to a master's. That was a mistake. <laughs> um, I definitely was super burned out towards the end there, and it was not great. Uh, not great for my mental health. I ended up, like, my hair started falling out when I was getting ready to defend my master's thesis. It was, like, really intense. Um, so burnout is real, and it is okay to be like, I'm done. I'm going to not science for a little bit because I need a break. Um, because I felt like if I stopped, I was, that was it. Like, there was no rest. I felt like you couldn't take a break. Um, and now I know I could have taken a break, and I should have taken a break, and I would have been a lot more sane. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so now I kind of tell everyone that I meet, like, dude, think about it. Take a pause. Take a break. You've been doing a lot of science. You've been doing a lot of schooling. If you need to take a break, take a break. Science will still be here. You're not going to get left behind. Um, it's totally fine to be like, yeah, I'm going to not. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, I'm just going to say this really quick. One of the things that's been really nice for me is among the four of us, we've all essentially said like, I'm taking a break from doing stuff with Miss Elasmo right now because we all are doing a lot of stuff constantly also outside of stuff for Miss. Um, and for me, it was really nice to feel comfortable being like, I'm doing nothing for a week, just telling you because I'm dying. Um, and it's just been like really, it's been a nice wake up call for me because I also have been feeling that way where like, I'm taking this year off, but I feel like I need to be getting into a grad program next fall if I want to keep doing science, because it's just going to, like, go away, and all the opportunities will be gone. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll throw something in real quick. I also took a, I took a break in between undergrad and graduate school, but it was, like, unintentional for me. I was like, I want to go straight into grad school, and when I finished school, it was kind of one of those things that, like, defined me I was like I have to be in school all the time and as soon as I finished and I didn't have any more school to do like I kind of did the opposite of what Jasmine did I just like kind of broke down I was like oh my gosh like I have no purpose anymore blah blah, blah. but like I think that it definitely was good for me to take that year off because you kind of just figure out yourself a little before you go back into the whole busyness of being in school and getting into research and um you also kind of confirm like all right do i actually do do i want to go back to school because if you're already in school and you're in the middle of it you're like i don't want to do this you just probably wasted a lot of money too <laughs> but yeah so taking breaks are good um, I took a break off work this week because I was like, I need a mental health break because I haven't had a break since I defended my thesis since before I even started school. So I was like, I need a break. So I took a break and it's very okay to take some breaks. <laughs> we need yeah. it. We're only human. <laughs> I would say taking a break from science if you need it like a year off of school does not make you less of a scientist. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because I feel like people are like, oh, if I take a break, then people aren't going to take me seriously or like they don't think I work hard enough. Like no one thinks that science is difficult. It's fun, but it's hard and you deserve a break sometimes. You don't have to just go, 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 go. So I think, yeah, definitely be okay with taking a break if you need it. That's not a bad thing. And the reality of it is that it's not all science. We all have lives and families that we come from, and those things are very important, and they all need their priorities. So, so yeah, excellent advice. Excellent advice. Um, going a little lighter here with this next question, what has been your favorite field experience so far? Clearly not Shark Rash. Ooh, I'll go. Oh, wait, are we going in order? Or No, go <laughs> ahead. Go. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I say this all the time, but 
during my um, surveys in Belize, when I was looking at, I was surveying the behavior of nurse sharks in a specific area. It's like five feet of water, seagrass, like right off the barrier reef. And we're just like doing a survey one day and the boat captain is like, oh my gosh, there's a hammerhead shark and starts pointing. So naturally I immediately start swimming towards where he's pointing. <laughs> and all of a sudden like, this great hammerhead and like it was weird because I was only in about five feet of water but this eight foot giant animal just cruises by like super close to me and I we like locked eyes and I was like oh my gosh this is my first time in the water with a big hammerhead like that and I was just like oh my gosh and like there's also like hundred tourists in the water and like sharks are being fed and I'm just like oh my gosh what's going what's gonna happen <laughs> But yeah, that was easily my favorite um, moment in the field because it was my first time swimming with a big shark like that. And I didn't get eaten, so that was nice. So. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> uh, mine's also with a great hammerhead. Mine's the first time that I did a workup on a hammerhead. I would think I was just like on cloud nine the entire time of that. It just, I was like, this is what heaven feels like. Um, like it was just this beautiful great hammerhead and she was pregnant and I like was taking all the measurements and she was almost a meter in girth, which is from one pectoral fin to the next. And I was like, you are massive and I love you. <laughs> um, and then like releasing her and watching her swim off, I was like, I could die right now. I could just die and be happy. <laughs> I have not actually had field experience with sharks yet, but I did intern at Odyssey Aquarium in Scottsdale, Arizona, and on orientation day, me and the other two aquarist interns were getting like a tour around the building, just trying to see where the different exhibits were. So we were on top of the shark exhibit, and as we were climbing down, I heard a gigantic splash, and we all got soaked. I thought that one of the other interns had fallen into the exhibit, I was going to laugh before I helped him get out, but it turned out that the largest shark in the exhibit, a giant female lemon shark, thrashed her tail and splashed the heck out of all of us, like a welcome to the aquarium rookies kind of thing, and I thought it was the funniest thing ever, and I was like, You're, we're going to be friends, girl. We're, we're going to be good friends, and we were. She was a great shark. <laughs> um, so my story is is, is a roller coaster. Um, so it was my first time, like Simone mentioned, uh, not everyone's like drives boats. So like I got to grad school and like I had driven my dad's little like John boat where you just like sit on the back with just like, you know, rotate, physically rotate the engine, not like with a central console where there's like multiple engines and all kinds of things happening. Um, so I was driving while setting a long line, which is like super difficult because there's gear in the water and you're like trying not to run over it, trying not to flip your boat, out, lots of things happen. And so this was my first time driving. I was already super stressed about it. And then we pull a lemon shark on the back of the boat and lemon sharks just like to bite things because they're just angry little critters. And it decided, I'm going to bite your engine because why not? Um, so it bit through our hydraulic steering cable. Um, so there's steering fluid going everywhere. This lemon shark has the engine like in its mouth. We had to like get pliers to pry it off and just like fluids going everywhere. And then I'm like, um, I can't steer anymore. <laughs> and my advisor's like, uh, all right, we're just gonna, let's just get this guy back in the water. And I'm like, I can't steer. Oh my God, this is so bad. And we're like offshore, of course, there's like big waves. I'm like, I'm, we're gonna die. This is how we die right here. Um, and so he just quickly duct taped it and threw some more fluid in. And he was like, whatever you do, don't steer. He's like, just steer as little as possible so we don't like leak a bunch of fluid everywhere. I'm like, okay, so on top of my first time driving and hauling gear, I'm supposed to not steer? Okay, that's fine. Um, so we eventually get all of the gear in the water. I didn't sink the boat and my advisor, Dean, turns to me and goes, you did it. 
he gave me a high five and he was like you drove through that you can drive through anything you are now a pro and I was just like oh I did it I'm out here <laughs> succeeding at real. life <laughs> that's right that is a fantastic story <laughs> definitely out here Jenny do you have a story Oh my gosh, I don't have a story. Uh, I was so enthralled with all of yours. I mean, I think because I come from the aquarium world, we have some field opportunities, but honestly, my favorite just in the water with shark moment was when I was working at Georgia Aquarium and we did our first physicals on whale on a whale shark. And there was so much planning and anxiety involved in this and getting this you know miniature school bus sized animal into a stretcher and then we got it in there and you know we did you know so many people around there's like 20 30 people on deck you know so many multiple veterinarians everybody's working on it and everything and then i just remember after the release and the animal swam off and everything was fine and we all got out of the water and then it was like we did it and it was amazing and it was like oh my gosh and it was that moment after doing all of that because it was the first time you know that anybody that we had known of had really done a physical on a whale shark and gotten blood on it and you know getting getting those samples for the first time on a live whale shark uh you know just really so exciting and just just the camaraderie with everyone there. And then like little school kids, yay, we did it! You know, it was just, just so wonderful. So that's, that's probably one of my ultimate moments. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. Um, the only one that I can, well, not the only one, but one that comes to mind is uh, a while back, there was a news story that broke about this um, in Delaware Bay where we did our research. Um, we we were long lining um and on that particular day they caught a my lab caught a, a sandbar a, a really large sandbar um that had a smooth dogfish in its mouth and so when we pulled up the long line yeah right i know amani's like what yes if you look if you look it up they called it like shark turn duncan it was everywhere like there were news articles about it like this was this is crazy, but when they pulled up the long line, like you see the dog, you see the, uh, you see the sandbar, but inside its mouth was, was the dogfish. Insane, right? Like, yes, insane, crazy. So look that up, um, Google that. Yahoo News definitely ran a story about it. Um, so that's one of the ones I have. Uh, I thank y'all so much for joining us. Um, this has been fantastic and again I cannot say enough how happy I am to see y'all and all the work that y'all are doing and the way that it's come together and the way that you're giving back and the way that you are reaching out towards um, bringing other women and other minorities along in this work I mean that is amazing and y'all have done so much in such a little bit of time seriously and this is this is fantastic and it really again it really um, inspires me, obviously, and makes me really happy to see, and it makes me really hopeful for the future that there will be some more Jasmine's and Imani's and Carly's and Jada's and Jenny's out there doing all of this uh, work. So, and Simone's. And thank you, and Simone's. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, this has been fantastic. Do y'all want to plug um, your socials or anything? Yeah. We are at Miss underscore Elasmo on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find us on Facebook and our website is www.missalasmo.org. And uh, my personal Twitter is at Elasmo underscore gal. And I'll let everyone else share their personal Twitter names too. My personal Twitter is at sophistication. And my Instagram is at sophistication underscore. Um, my Twitter is at curly underscore biologist. And my Instagram is at Weber Schultz, which is a mouthful, but it's my last name. <laughs> uh, my Instagram and Twitter are the same. It's at Carly 
M J underscore, and that's Carly with two E's. Thank you all. And everyone, please also check out um, the Elasmo Week uh, recordings and sessions. Uh, do y'all want to give a plug for Elasmo Week and where people can find the videos? Yeah, so uh, all the Elasmo Week videos will be on the Miss YouTube page. Um, they are, most of them are live, but they will be recorded so that you can watch them at a later date as well. And we've got a lot of really awesome presentations. Some of them are pretty goofy, some of them are super informative, and they're all super fun and awesome. So you should check it out. Watch Jada rate sharks. Yes, I rated underrated sharks the other day. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> And, and my Elasma Week video may or may not have a sawfish birth that happens. That's pretty exciting on it. Just saying. <laughs> Rare footage. You should watch it. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Yes. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much um, for joining us again. And happy Elasma Week. And um, we hope to see you all again. Bye. Thanks for joining Thank us, you. audience.